So can you tell me a little bit about yourself, where your name and where you live and work? Sure. Um, my name is Ellen Van Osten, and I live and work in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, most of my work is connected with Case Western Reserve University, where I have worked for since 1995 myself, um, and so I've held a number of roles there at the university. Right. And what do you do now? Uh, currently, I'm a PhD student um, in the Department of Organization Behavior, which is at the Weatherhead School of Management. Um, and as, as part of um, completing my PhD degree, I'm in the midst of, of starting a dissertation um, and should be completed uh, with a PhD program then by next year. But I also uh, do a lot of executive coaching and I teach classes on emotional intelligence, leadership development, and coaching. So I teach for the university and I teach for clients. Right, right. And what, what's your educational background for doing that? So my educational background is a little mixed. I started off with an undergraduate degree in electrical engineering, and I worked in um, applications of engineering for a number of years, and then um, after, I guess, about five years, went back to get my MBA at the Weatherhead School, um, and I concentrated in organization behavior and leadership studies then. Um, and then um, started the PhD program also at Weatherhead in 2004. Right, right, right. And, and your training in, in coaching? So my uh, focus of my studies in the, um, in the program, in the PhD program, is all in executive coaching. Uh, my actual training in coaching comes from the Weatherhead School where we um, actually designed a lot of our coaching um, certificate programs there and so I went through my own programs I guess and, um, and so that's where most of my experience and work, work comes. Right. right. So. And how, how long time you, would you say you've been applying research in positive psychology or something similar in coaching? So the um, integration, I, I would say, of positive psychology um, into coaching probably has uh, started about 10 years ago for me. Um, one of our professors is involved in, and actually is the founder of Appreciative Inquiry um, as a methodology and philosophy for achieving sustainable change. Are you familiar, yeah. familiar with it? So David Cooperwriter was one of the professors I worked with for quite a while, and that of course was his dissertation. Um, so one of the kind of hallmarks of appreciative inquiry is to preserve the positive core, find out, discover, and preserve it, um, and to adapt a strengths-based approach to addressing opportunities as well as problems. And so I began working with him, um, designing and delivering executive programs for companies um, in the late 90s and so applying his those principles to coaching started I think in the early early 2000s. Right, right, right. Uh, David was a teacher in uh, Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and, and the people that you typically coach now, who are they? Um, the most of my coaching is with executive level managers and leaders and organizations. Most of the client base represents corporations, but it's not limited to that. So I have some folks at universities, for instance, um, some other nonprofits, some hospitals, and and the like. But most of the client, both organizationally and then the individuals, will be coming from all different kinds of corporations. Most of them are anchored in the U.S., so they might have a home base here. They might be stationed at different places around the country, or around the world rather, um, but they have some connection to Cleveland, most of them. Right, right, right. Um, and, and so how, how do you coach them? Uh, is that on the telephone, or do you meet with yeah, them? Yeah, the ones that are overseas, um, I coach either via the phone or using Skype, so right. video conference. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and what challenges or issues do they usually present when they, when they contact you? Well. The bulk of my coaching is all on leadership development, leadership effectiveness, basically. And so um, a lot of our work at Case Western Reserve University is on that. How do you help leaders become even more effective in their, in their work? Um, coaching is one of the resources we offer to help them 
with their own kind of self-awareness and path of change. Um, and we also kind of extend that then to help them not only be introspective, but also then take what they're learning about themselves and become better leaders and managers of others. So that's kind of the space that I'm almost always working in. Folks will either find their way to the university because they're interested in that for themselves, or the um, executive education arm of the Weatherhead School at Case will often have contracts with businesses where that's the, the kind of expressed desired outcome. So that's, given that as kind of the context, almost all of the work I'm doing with folks is around helping them become more effective right. as a leader. Um, how do they, for instance, engage with others more effectively? How can they kind of connect and resonate with more people more often? Um, how do they leverage emotional intelligence um, so they can become more effective? Those kinds of things. So. Um, I would say emotional intelligence and concepts like uh, resonant leadership and then more recently positive psychology kind of comprise the, the foundation of my work. Right, right, right. And, and what does it look like? What does a coaching engagement look like? They vary, but most of them are at a minimum three meetings um, up to usually six meetings. So anywhere between three and six. Usually over... Um, a period of time that would range from three to maybe nine months. So usually we're getting together uh, once a month, every four to six weeks, something like that, over the course of however long the coaching engagement is designed to last. Right. So. And how long is the meeting? Um, almost always two hours yeah. on average, I'd say two. Sometimes a little bit shorter based on the where we're at in our process, but usually at least an hour and a half to two. Right, right, right. Uh, right and and so, so what happens before the first meeting? So um, really depends on how I've got connected with the client. So let me share maybe two different um, contexts. One would be as if it's an individual who has uh, expressed interest in coaching and we've been matched or maybe they've um, kind of approached me directly, you know, and we've started a coaching engagement. So in, in any event, it's just one-on-one. -on -one. They're not connected with an organization or a program. Um, and in that, that situation, it almost always starts with some sort of conversation, usually over the phone about, tell me what, why you're interested in coaching. Tell me um, a little bit about yourself. Um, I ask them what they'd like to know about me and my background and, um, just in general what kind of uh, thoughts they would have about what a good coaching process would look like for them. And the purpose of that is just to get to know them, for them to get to know me and to gauge a fit, yeah. to see if there's a fit with style and uh, my style and also a fit with the process that I would be suggesting. And of course for me to understand their hopes and expectations for whatever they might do um, so that I, I know if I'm really the best person. Right. to work with them. Right, right, right. And, and so what, what's the process that you're suggesting? So um, a lot of my coaching uh, follows what the intentional change theory, and is that something you're familiar with? Okay. But yeah, so you, you can explain it. Go ahead it. and explain it. So intentional change theory um, is was developed by Richard Boyatzis at Case Western Reserve University. And it includes five different um, kind of stages, or we call them discoveries, um, which really, if followed and followed consistently, help an individual have um, a path for creating sustainable change for themselves. Um, the application that you and I are talking about is for the individual, but interestingly enough, um, Intentional change can be applied to a lot of different levels, so dyads, teams, organizations, societies. I mean, it's, it's not limited to individuals. So it's all about helping or facilitating sustainable change to occur. The five um, steps um, include starting off with the first one, um, discovering your ideal. And the ideal discovery phase is helping an individual discover their hopes and dreams, um, be able to articulate their deepest aspirations, you know, for their, their work, their lives. 
Um, it's very holistic, so we're not limited to be talking about work only or personal life only. We really kind of look at everything together. And the culmination of that or manifestation is a personal vision statement. So that, that's the discovery one. Um, the second would be what we call the um, exploration of the real self. And the um, real self is comprised of understanding your strengths and your weaknesses. So really doing a deep dive into what are those areas that are not just strengths, but distinctive strengths. So kind of even distinguishing among strengths for yourself. And then weaknesses. What weaknesses kind of get in your way? What might always get in your way? So the, we call those enduring dispositions, the kind of aspects of us that are always present, for instance. Um, the next discovery would be a learning, creative, crafting a learning agenda, which is where you put the pieces of the ideal self, this vision, what, what you want to do and who you want to be, mixed with your strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. So, so those kind of blend together in the form of learning goals and action um, plans. And then based on what someone might wish to do, what kind of uh, development they set out for themselves, then the fourth discovery is exploration and um, excuse me, experimentation and practice. So going out and trying new things, being able to, um, for instance, engage with your team differently if that's something you wanted to um, experiment with, uh, listening better, you know, experimenting with that, and, and then seeing how that's working or not working for you. Yeah. The last um, stage is trusting relationships. And trusting relationships is important, we know, um, at any point of, of, in the change process, but especially for us as adults to change. It's difficult when we're talking about usually changing behaviors, changing attitudes, um, kind of creating connection or resonance in a relationship that's different. And so the only way to go is kind of with help, you know, with support, but those have to be trusting relationships. So we encourage people to think about that, okay. um, to develop a personal board of directors, for instance. So all those stages and steps comprise the intentional change theory, and that really um, offers or provides, I guess, the, the coaching process I use the most. So our meetings will follow that yeah. for the most part. Right, right, right. And so, so when you say follow that, is that one stage, one session, or...? Usually it's, it's not that um, kind of absolute, because when you're coaching, you always want to meet the other person where they are. And so what I do is offer that as an upfront process and then make sure that client knows that this is a customizable process, that we're going to adapt it based on um, what their interest and needs are and if they want to go a little bit further in a certain area versus others. So, um, so I just adapt that based on our conversation and what the client is presenting and what I'm understanding their needs to be at that time. So, um, so for instance, I just met with somebody yesterday who feels we're just getting started and she's, she's great with the process. She really thought it would, would be helpful and she asked if it's okay if we spend a little bit more time on the ideal. Right, right. Because she feels that she's really good at listing all of the things she doesn't do well, but she really hasn't thought about what's really important to her and she has a hard time spending much time on strengths she just skips over it and immediately focuses on all these problems and weaknesses right, and right, right, right. then all of her development plans throughout her life have always been on fixing the problem. Right, 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 yeah. So so with her, we, we might not spend much time at all on weaknesses um, because she's spent 25 years on them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so to yeah, spend yeah, the yeah, next yeah. six to eight months just let's make sure you're on solid ground in terms of what you do really well yeah. will maybe the best gift for her. Right, right, right. And, and you said something about your style. What, what, what's your style? Well, I, intentional change offers, an, I think, an element um, to the style. So you, I always present that to see how, they, um, how that sounds to them, if that's a process they, you know, that they think that, that would be helpful and useful and, and agreeable, really, yeah. if, if that's what they're hoping for. Um, some folks, for instance, might enter into coaching just thinking they're going to fix something, something like this, something small. And my approach and style 
would be to kind of, let's take a step back and open this wide up and start with you and what you really care about. So that would be uh, what I mean by you know, how the model would influence my style. Right. Um, I ask a lot of questions and try not to prescribe too many answers. So I, I um, offer that up front and say that's my style and ask if that's okay with them. Um, and part of the, that discovery and, un, and kind of mutual understanding is to know what they want to get out of the coaching. So um, even thinking about the role, my role is kind of asking them questions and facilitating their own thinking. Some folks are not familiar with coaching and they think it is more, I'm going to tell them what to do or give them advice right, right. on this set of issues, which if they need that, I say, if you think you need that or if that would be helpful, you want to ask about some something, I'm, of course I'm willing to answer that. But um, but in those moments, I'm not coaching. I'm, I'm answering or advising, which yeah. is a little different. So um, so I just try to draw those distinctions right. and, um, and listen as much as I can. So facilitating their own thinking through things, I guess, is the way I articulate my style. Right, right, right. So. And, and, and this... Telling them about the process that's ha that's happening in the first meeting before uh, actually before the first meeting like uh... it starts in the first conversation almost always over the phone and then I um, document it in a in a um, couple pages and send it to them for them to kind of see it in writing and then when we get together we in the first kind of official kickoff of the coaching process. Part of the agenda for that meeting is to walk through that together yeah. and to just to make sure if, that they're clear um, with what's in it and agreeable to it and then we both sign right. so that we've got kind of a letter um, or a memo of understanding yeah. of our process that we're going to follow and um, a bit about roles, each, each one of our roles. Um, you know, a, I have a pledge to confidentiality that's included within that. Um, and of course, all the other more instrumental things like investment and time frame and whatnot. So right. then we both sign that document right, uh, right. as part of that meeting. So after the, those first two discussions, we usually don't revisit that particular document um, specifically, although we'll refer to kind of the process that's laid out. Right, 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 right. And and so in in a in a session. Like the first, or second, or third session, do you have an agenda? Or? I do. So I usually um, have that process laid out in the document I just mentioned at a high level. You know, so for instance, meeting one would be about getting to know the client, um, where I'd, I'd like to do a career and life history. So we talk about how they got to where they are today, and then we spend some time on what they do today and kind of what their current context is. So that would be an example of part of what we cover in the first meeting along with the uh, discussion of the con contract, like I mentioned. We also then talk about assignments, you know, what they are going to be working on between now and the next one. So, um, so that happens just in the very first meeting. Um, the second discussion is almost always about the ideal self. So we start off with that, that first discovery I had mentioned, and so they will have done homework or pre-work, you know, for that conversation, where they, I assigned a lot of different exercises. I assigned a lot of uh, a book that we use quite a bit, uh, a workbook called Becoming a Resonant Leader. So I assign questions in that workbook for them to do, and then the assignment at the end is culminates in them crafting a personal vision. So, th so that's an example of kind of what they come to for the second discussion. Um, so we'll have an agenda around discussing that process in the second meeting, how did it go? Tell me about the questions you answered. Tell me about that whole experience. And then tell me about your vision. And that might be a good um, hour and a half conversation just on debriefing that experience for them. Right. The third meeting often is around their real self. So sometime between the second and the third time we get together, they will have done a 360 degree feedback assessment. Um, that assessment, is, the one I use the most is from the Hay Group. And it's on um, emotional intelligence. It's called the Emotional Competence Inventory. So we use that, I use that a lot, and we use that quite a bit at Case Western Reserve University. So they will have collected feedback from raiders, and I'll have the report for them yeah. at that third meeting. Um, the fourth meeting will be about them 
kind of debriefing or kind of analyzing for themselves the meaning of that report further and pulling from it what they want to work on. So one or two things that they care about, for instance. Um, and so then they're, they're starting to put all this into action now, applying the vision, applying the strengths and weaknesses to what they really want to do tomorrow, next week, that kind of thing. And then the uh, fifth and sixth meetings often are around kind of checking in on how that's going, what they're learning, um, what's working, you know, what's not working, how is that helping them reach the goals that they've laid out, for instance. Um, and the whole process culminates with um, us kind of thinking about or me encouraging them to think about how they've grown and learned from the whole experience and then how do you cascade that to others. So now that you've gone through this and you're a leader of others, what elements of this might you, you know, can you take forward and integrate into your own leadership and coaching approaches with others? As well as how do you sustain this for yourself? So we start to help them thinking to think about going forward without me here, without a coach there, without a meeting like this. How do you keep all this great momentum going for yourself? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you mentioned the 360 assessment. Do you, do you use other assessments? Um, I do. There's two others I use frequently. One of them is called the learning style inventory. Um, and so that's helpful for folks just to get a sense of how they prefer to take in information and then what they do with it. Yeah. Um, the other one I use quite a bit is called the Managerial Styles Workbook, and both of those are also available through the Hay Group. They're both self-reports, um, but they're assessments to help, help them just kind of build their own self-awareness. The Managerial Styles Workbook focuses on different leadership styles um, that most individuals exhibit and they kind of see what they prefer to use, what they use most often as a leadership style, and then based on how they answer the questions, they compare that to what they think the job requires right. of them. Right. So some interesting like insights come out of that for them um, often, and um, so that helps, it's been helpful I think to, to, for them in that process. And so, so, I assume that they answer the, the assessment in between the sessions and then they bring the result? Usually. Right. So I usually assign it and then sometime within the four to six weeks between the, the last meeting and the next meeting, um, they complete it and bring it to the coaching discussion. So, so they bring it or send it? Um, it really depends. Usually it's a hard copy if I'm meeting in person. They physically bring it if it's over the phone or Skype then um, they'll either scan a page or even just hold, if it's Skype, they just hold it up so I can see the report and we talk from it. Right, right. Um, because there's only really like one page in each that is the graph I really like to see. The rest of it is helping them kind of make sense of right, what, right. It's, what it says about them and to them. So, right. so I, can, I can have that conversation without physically seeing something if I'm not face to face with them. But if if I can I'll have them scan a page or just hold it up. Right, right. And so so what's the conversation like? What what what, what do you say or ask or about any of the assessments? Yeah, or yeah, what, yeah, yeah. What? How, how do you kind of give feedback on it? Yeah. Well, um I usually just start off by having them um tell me what the experience was like completing it. Um, so that I know if there was any sort of emotion connected to it. So I might hear, that was really hard, or I was frustrated by those questions, or I couldn't get into it. So that's important data for me just to know. It helps me know a little bit about the person, helps me to know about their reaction to the tool. So if there's anything I might need to take into account. Then I, I ask um, usually what they, what they learned about themselves. And so they'll go, right into kind of what the report or the assessment told them. And we'll get into the results. Um, and then from there, it usually just flows pretty naturally um, because they'll have insights and I'm able to just listen and kind of validate when they got their finger on something that I think is makes a lot of sense, um, as well as maybe um, 
kind of supplement with some additional perspective if I feel that they haven't thought of something holistically or completely. Um, if And then based on if they're not seeing something, I'll maybe ask a couple questions. Have you considered this? Or did you, what do you think about X or Y? And then, you know, that'll lead to more learning in the session for them. Right, right, right. right. What, what about interventions? Positive interventions, do you use any? So, um, help me with like, how do you define interventions? Uh, things that they do, think or do, that, yeah. so, so uh, there, there are some very popular ones like three good things, mm -hmm. uh, or using strengths in new ways, or, mm -hmm. it's it basically many of the homework assignments could be positive interventions. Yeah, that, that's why I asked the question, because I think I probably assigned a lot of different things I hadn't really considered them to be interventions, perhaps. Um, so, um, the one that I spend a lot of time on, um, that I think in and of itself is an intervention, is that first step of the intentional change theory, that whole um, understanding, discovering, understanding, accepting, and articulating your ideal self. Yeah. Um, so the the articulation comes in a person verbalizing it back to me and also in writing, writing it out. Right? Um, so some folks, some most folks enjoy this process, although they may struggle at different parts of it, but when they get through it, they'll often tell me that that was really worthwhile and great, even if they did struggle early on, they, they saw meaning and value in it for themselves. But the process in and of itself is really important, I think, for their own growth and learning. Um, and so if it takes someone a little bit longer, then I really want to spend that time with them, as opposed to maybe kind of skipping, skipping it over to rush through the process. I, I don't really want to do that. So my, my hope and goal would be to be able to have them articulate to me a vision that's holistic meaning that it, it includes elements of many different arenas of their life, work, family, um, community, spirituality, health, um, fitness, what's gonna kind of together. Um, so those are some big recreation, you know, like whatever we can come up with that's um, important to them. I'd like to kind of remind them that to at least consider it, and is that something that you want to include in your vision? Um, so, so that's kind of a check that I do. Another is the extent to which I feel they um, are owning the vision. Like, are they just going through the motions and repeating something, or do they really believe in it? Is it truly their vision? And and I, you could just tell it's pretty easy to know. It's if you're faking it or just like not into it, you can just tell because. Your emotion, even if it's over the phone, I can tell it's, if it's flat that yeah. somebody is is not really engaged yeah. in the process. Um, most folks get very engaged, so it's a very energetic kind of um, stimulating experience for them, and a lot of kind of positive emotion comes out of it. Yeah, yeah. So um, not always, because what happens is that. People often begin to wrestle with the ideal self versus the ought self. So that while I think the intervention is a positive psychology or falls under positive psychology tool, perhaps the process in and of itself has you know different cycles or iterations to it. One often is, well, if this is my ideal, am I living that now, or what? what life am I living and is it one that's been kind of told to me by my parents, by my boss, by my advisor, or you know, some external voice has said you're going to be X or you should do X and you've bought into it. So so it, some folks really kind of have to work through a lot of issues, especially the ideal versus the ought, but but kind of the the end all of the experience or the overall kind of outcome, I guess, often is very positive. Right, right, right. So that would be an example of one that I use. Um, another would be, um, you know, we spend a lot of time on strengths, and so I try to get them to articulate a three to one ratio on strengths. So um, I'll have them 
build me a, like a personal balance sheet for themselves and then I'm looking at the left side which is the strengths next to the right side which is the liabilities and I will spend some time on that so that if there's if there's not more strengths I'll inquire as to why that it is the way it is and then ask them to go back and think about how they can build in more strengths um, or if they want to work on they say I really want to work on developing my people more. So they zero in on a weakness, I'll say, great, because that's where their energy is, so I want to go with that. I say, okay, now what are three strengths you can leverage that's going to help you do that? So I, I use this kind of three to one, at a minimum, three to one balance between um, kind of positive and negative strengths, weaknesses throughout the coaching. Right, right, right. Other things? So those are a couple. Um, are there interventions what? or processes? Yeah, so um, another element or kind of process that um, that I'm just starting to use actually is is comes from the University of Michigan. It's the reflective best self exercise. You're familiar with that? So um, having people capture stories, like interview others and capture stories from others about when they were at their best. Um, having them go out and do that and then bring that back and looking at the themes together would be another example of one that, um, that um, like I said, I'm just starting to use now. So mm -hmm. those, are the, those are three that come to that, I think, the top of, of my head. You know, we do a lot of work at our, at our university around the kind of natural tension between two each attractors one call is we call it the positive emotional attractor, and the other is the negative emotional attractor. We abbreviate those as PEA and NEA. And when you're going through a change process, you're trying to develop a new leadership habit, um, you want to develop personally and professionally in some new way, um, we are always going to have these kind of tensions or attractors present. Um, they always pull us towards one end or the other, and things we engage in can push us to one end or the other. Um, what we find is important in, in coaching, I, we try to integrate this, is to have people spend more time um, in the positive emotional attractor space over the negative. So the helping people create a vision for themselves would be an example of putting them, like facilitating that they're in this PEA space when I have them think about, you know, what are they most passionate about? What are they, um, what's their purpose? You know, what do they draw the most meaning from in their life? What are their core values? These are all questions and exercises I want them to do that I'm intentionally trying to put them in this PEA space. Even when I do assessments with them, the whole three to one on strengths versus weaknesses is intentional because I'm trying to get them to put themselves kind of back in this place of positivity or positive emotion. Um, so that is, I guess, kind of integrated throughout all the coaching I do, but the, the framework or the philosophy behind it is this PEA-NEA um, tension and that how we really, I think as leaders for ourselves and also when we're engaging others, we really need to recognize that a minimum is three to one. Yeah. And that's coming from and validated by Barbara Fredrickson's work. Yeah, yeah. Right. So she's done phenomenal research in that area, um, and that's been kind of a great link, kind of a huge support for um, for this belief and approach that we use. Right, right, right. What What about knowledge sharing? You said to begin with that you try not to prescribe answers. Yeah. Um, well, I, I do share knowledge. I try to be guided by when the client is asking for it as a rule of thumb. Um, so the coaching experiences that I have and do are, as I mentioned, they involve a lot of questions to facilitate the other person thinking through um, whatever their, their issue is because it's their process. You know, I'm the facilitator of it. But, um, but also I like to have it just be a dialogue so it's a natural kind of back and forth. Um, so I'll share information usually in under two circumstances. One is if um, I'm, I think it's helpful to validate or affirm something they've said. It might be some insight they've had about themselves that they're kind of discovering, so they're not completely sure you know, that they're on solid ground with this insight. 
So I might um, offer my own experience as support. I might offer the kind of validation from all the work we've done at the university and it, if that applies, or articles I've written or read or just research in general, I'll draw from like research that I'm familiar with. And for those who like it or are interested in it, I'll offer to send them the article often. So um, some folks are, they'll say, I just love to read, you know, and I'd love to, uh, I just drink in information. So if I know that about the person, then I'm, I'm a little more forthcoming sometimes yeah. because I know they like it, that yeah. they want that. Um, so I might share more and I'll offer to send them different things. So that's one situation. The other is if they explicitly ask for it. Right. So, you know, I really would love to know, like, what's your experience when working with so many people? Do, do you see this? Do you not see this? You know, so they really are curious and they're just asking for my, uh, asking about my experience or asking for my insight. And so I'll just answer that yeah, for them. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I I try to be cognizant not to, um, that's kind of let that go on and on. Yeah. Because it is their meeting and it is their process. So, yeah, yeah. so I'll share, you know, for whatever, a couple minutes and then um, just go go based on kind of either additional questions they have or uh, I'll reframe the question back to them and kind of get us back on their process. Right, right. And you mentioned that it, uh, if they like it, how, how do you know whether or not they like it? Um, well, usually body language and just, and feedback that I'm getting from them. So if I'm in front of them and they're lighting up and nodding, I can usually tell that they're engaged in whatever I'm saying. They're agreeing with it or they, you know, it's interesting for them or something like that. Um, and if it's over the phone, I, um, and I'll usually pick it up by the way that they're um, kind of engaged in the discussion. And if, well, however they respond to it, if they come back with more questions, like, well, what about this? Or, I'd love to know that. Or sometimes they, they have a different opinion. So that they, well, I, you know, I've never thought of it this way. So, so to the extent to which they're engaged verbally, right, right. Um, is another way for me to know. So I just kind of read, read the situation. Right, 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 right. Um. And if I don't know, I just say, is that helpful? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, or is that, is that what you wanted to know or were hoping for me to share? Just so I know if I've answered that question. If I'm, and they'll either say yes, no, or they'll be like, well, you know, I actually was thinking about something else, you know, or I needed to know about something else. So then it takes us in that, in that direction. Right. So I just stay as connected as I can be to the other person. Right. But can you say something about adapting things to tailoring things to each client? Sure. Um, well, I think if you really try to stay connected to the client's issues, you really being open and asking them questions and listening, it's pretty easy to then be adaptable because um, coaching is, is an individualized process, you know, that is designed to help a person uh, develop in whatever way they desire. At least that's how I think of coaching and kind of the, the essence of my work. So for that to be successful and effective, it's really the client's agenda all the way through. And I become um, kind of the partner on the path, walking side by side with them. So um, I present the process, but always check in with them. So how I do that is usually when we start off a meeting, I always say, here's Here's what we um, can cover today. Uh, is there anything else you want to add to this? Is there anything you want to emphasize or make sure we spend more time on? Um, or is there anything else that you know if that you want to talk about first? So that if there's something on their mind, sometimes it's a meeting that they had yesterday with their boss that's bothering them, so it's more current. Um, something it, something uh, could also be they have a big presentation or a big meeting coming up or a performance review conversation or something that is distracting them and they would like to talk about it. So in those moments, really my role shifts to be a sounding board. I'm just listening, kind of. And whatever it is that they need, they say, I just need to talk about this or I just need your help thinking that through, we'll go there. Right. So, um, so that's one way I do it and kind of how it gets manifested. Also, um, based on where we are in this process, um, if they're 
having, if they're really engaged and really enjoying it, like they say for the ideal self, they just are loving kind of thinking through these things, they haven't done it before and they're telling me this, then I might assign more questions and spend more time there. Right. Um, on the flip side, if they're really struggling with it, we still might spend more time there, but I'll change it and really try to understand what the struggle is about. Sometimes we have to unpack something from a long time ago. Um, or at least kind of figure out what is um, the roadblock, have them articulate it, and that might take uh, a process that I don't, you know, you can't really predict how much time it's going to take. Right. So, um, and sometimes you end up in places that are pretty emotional for people, so you might have that, that you also are experiencing with them. So, you just, I just try to remain very fluid to responding to where they're at emotionally and their level of engagement with what we're working on and also going back to kind of what their overall goals were for themselves. So I always kind of check back on that. Um, okay. I have a couple of questions. So, so what, what do you do when you encounter a roadblock? Like how do, how do you handle it or deal with it? Yeah. So. Let me just take a minute because I think if I can give you a couple examples that might really help. Um, so usually if I'm, a roadblock may present itself where um, somebody has been really hard on themselves like their whole life so that they are really focused on the negative all the time. And I worked with somebody um, fairly recently who's a very senior level person in an organization and this whole process as I described has a lot of positive psychology built into it, positive interventions and I could tell by their physical reaction and the fact that they were not really doing the assignments that they were e either dismissing it or struggling with it. I wasn't sure what but the result was they weren't engaged. Mm. And so um, in, in the, that situation, and often, I'll just share my observation back with them in a very neutral kind of way, or objective way, and just say, here's what we said we were going to talk about, here's what you were going to work on. Did you bring that? You know, if sometimes they won't send it to me ahead of time, even though I request it. That's okay. So, so did you bring it? Bring your answers. Uh, no, I really didn't get very far with that. So I'll say, well, tell me about that. And so they often will explain what whatever happened. Is that um, I really have not been able to dedicate the time. So then we'll talk about why haven't you been able to dedicate the time? What time were you able to dedicate? And often as we start kind of going deeper into the issues, what you come up against is their like um, assumptions um, their mindset that they have around their own development, the value judgments they place on themselves and their own development. Um, and until we can kind of get there and have them really kind of own it, it's hard to move forward. So own what? Own, that, own whatever it is. So this individual I was working with was not able to articulate his vision easily and didn't really do a lot of the assignments. And when I had asked him, how many did you do? And he had a couple. We spent some time talking about those. And, and I you know, asked him, what was that like for you to do it? And he said, well, that was, it was interesting, you know. But I said, well, what about the others? And he said, I just couldn't get into them. And I said, well, why, why couldn't you get into them? He said, well, I, I work till like 7.30, 8 o'clock, and then I go home, and I try to spend time with my family for a little bit. And then it would be like 11 o'clock at night, and I was so tired, I couldn't even think about these things. So I said, is that kind of a usual schedule for you? And he said, yeah. I said, so basically you spend, you know, the bulk of your day at work, come home, spend maybe two hours with your family and then kind of collapse. And he said, yeah. So we talked then about how he is choosing to expend his energy and is that the way he wishes to expend his energy and spend his time. So I was able to kind of get him back to a discussion on the ideal self because I got him back to, well, this is what you're doing now and how's that working? And it wasn't really working that great. Mm. Um, he was feeling like he was exhausted all the time. He feels like he 
is probably micromanaging his team. And his wife's not happy because he's really not home very early and he's not making his kids games, so it really is not working. But I had to have him discover that right. on his own. And then he was open to thinking, when I asked him, well, how would you, what would you love to have it be? So then he started to articulate like a life and we came at it from a schedule. But really it was, he was describing the kind of life you wanted to have, which really is the ideal self. Right. So yeah. then I just said, that's your ideal self. I and mean, what you're getting at is your ideal self. That's what all this is kind of designed to do. So we, I was able to kind of get him to the same place. Right. Right. But sometimes you have to help the person um, maybe articulate it or as they're, sh as they're sharing it, kind of stop them and say, that's a great vision statement mm -hmm. right there because they don't even know that that's what it is. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's one example. Another roadblock I have a lot. I work with a lot of folks who are engineers. And the more quantitatively trained the individual, the tougher time they have on the strengths. Right, right. It seems. And so lots of folks are just so fixated on weaknesses to a point where it's like I have to kind of drag them, like, metaphorically, you know, of course, kicking and screaming to like focus on their strengths. And one person recently, two actually, I had this conversation with, I said, I'm just curious, why are you resisting talking about your strengths so much? And, um, they, two different people answer two different ways, but this is why it's so important to not project or assume what it'll be, right? But one guy said, well, I kind of grew up with humility as a virtue, and if I'm talking about myself and all the great things about me, it doesn't feel like I'm being very humble. So he said, I'm really uncomfortable um, kind of with all this attention on myself um, when I know that there's lots of things I can work on. There's things I do well, but there's a lot I can work on. So I'm much more comfortable talking about that because that way I don't feel like I'm being egotistical and arrogant. So we had to talk about humility as a virtue and is this very process kind of counter to that, um, which it's not at all, but having him understand or think about this is first of all, just you and I, it's not lots of other people. So you're not boasting. Secondly, you need to have clarity around what you do well and what you um, might struggle with so that you can have a clear sense of yourself and be able to leverage your strengths in helping you change. Because if you skip over them, boy, it's a lot harder way to go. Um, and that you can use those in, in service of it. Also, those are um, areas where you can teach others. You know, there's, there's great coachable moments right in the space of the kind of competencies and these aspects of you that come naturally to you that to somebody else, it doesn't. So that kind of, I think, light bulbs kind of went off for him. I think I had to give him permission to talk about his strengths, at least with me privately, that I wasn't going to think he was egotistical. Mm. That I still, you know, could see that he had humility but, and try to help him understand the difference. Um, and then um, just to be able to help him think about the importance of strengths as it relates to his desire to coach others, his desire to change, how you leverage strengths, and not just focus on weaknesses. The other individual, she just said, I just kind of like to solve problems. I'm an, I'm an engineer. I've always trained that way. My father was an engineer. She said, so I kind of see the world as like, well, if that's an issue, can't we come up with a, a way to counteract that and a way to solve it, a way to address it. So in her case, it's just how her preferred way of operating. Yeah. And she just she said, I just I just have a work ethic too that I work really hard. So I don't feel like I need to if I've accomplished something, that's great, but I'm gonna go work hard right. on solving the problem. So those are just a couple examples I think that maybe help to show it's always individual you know yeah. like everyone's issues are no two people are alike mm -hmm. and that you while the process is i think helpful to have up front you want to just kind of be able to i call it bob and we based on where you need to go yeah, yeah. to help the other person get to where they want to go right right 
You also mentioned uh, a couple of minutes ago something about uh, some of them becoming emotional. H how do you handle that? What do you do? Um, well, I try to provide a safe space in all my coaching conversations, meaning that the time that we have together, the other person feels very safe, being themselves, saying whatever comes to mind, and okay with whatever kind of emotion might come up. Um, it's not uncommon for people to um, be moved to tears, especially as we're talking about the ideal self conversation that's usually where it may happen doesn't always um, because we're talking about what has, holds a deep deep meaning for people and also um, often people in that discovery realize they're living pretty far away from that meaning like the way they're living their life now is not close to the way they really want to and so that provokes sometimes a sadness sometimes it's um, frustration. Um, sometimes they, they just don't know, but they're just really overwhelmed kind of by the whole thing. So when it happens, I just um, try to just let them have some time, get out the emotion, and let them know it's okay, because they, they usually apologize. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm so sorry. There's no need to be sorry. But we are emotional. We're not machines. So I really go back to that a lot. You know, a lot of my work is in emotional intelligence and helping people understand that. that there's a reason that we're not the machine, that we're human. And so part of who we are includes emotions and emotional reactions. And part of emotional intelligence is understanding that about ourselves. What triggers an emotional response, what, um, emotional responses might be kind of most common for us. So is it emotional outbursts that are angry? Or is it, you know, someone who's joking all the time? Or is it somebody who's like, you know, prone to tears? We often, we have, not for everybody, but often people have kind of a tendency. Yeah. Um, and rarely is it both ends of the spectrum. So understanding what that is and then understanding if that shows up at work or in our relationships and if it's a positive thing or if it's a detriment to the situation is um, kind of what we what we sometimes talk about but in the actual moment when there might be some some sort of um, tears or whatever I'll just give them time to kind of collect themselves and I asked um, Recently, I asked this woman who happened to get really pretty emotional. I said, well, what do you think the tears are about? And um, I didn't expect an answer. And I said, I don't need you to answer this right now. But I think you want to think about this and journal, maybe, because we do a lot, I asked them to do a lot of journaling, what the tears are about. And I met with her just last week, actually. I worked with her last year, so it was a full year later. We had another coaching conversation, like a follow-up. And she told me that that question that I asked her what the tears were about, um, like unleashed like this whole process of forgiveness for her, of herself and others. And um, she said, it really took me down a path that I probably would never have gone, but I had to really think about what was it that I was crying about? And so, and then I had to work through it because part of it was disappointment at the way the company had treated her, disappointment and kind of what people had said to her, like promises they had made. Um, and so she wasn't where she felt she wanted to be in the organization and doing the kind of work she wanted to do. And here the tears were about this kind of disappointment and anger as well as sadness all bundled together and so when she reflected on that question and really spent some time on it she got herself through her own process to a place where she had to actually forgive yeah so i didn't know that till we had this follow-up meeting a year later 
so I guess that's just to answer your question, how I tried to handle it in the situation, yeah. and then it's, it was really kind of gratifying and, and interesting to see kind of how that became a catalyst for her to do her own work. Right, right. You also mentioned before um, that you sometimes go back to the goals, revisit them. Yeah. So, so can you say something about that? Sure. So in almost at the beginning of every meeting or sometime throughout the meeting, um, or maybe in an email setting up the next meeting, I'll refer to um, what it was that they originally wanted to get out of the coaching. Um, I also refer back to their vision a lot. Um, so that there's links back to the work they had done on that. Um, so I kind of link link back to both fairly consistently, or I try to, and it's pretty straightforward. I often just will um, kind of integrate it into the conversation. You know, at the beginning, this is something you said that you wanted to get out of the coaching um, experience, the work that you've done so far. Do you feel like you're getting closer to that? So sometimes it's a check-in on the process. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll remind them this was your goal, so I want to make sure I'll strongly suggest we talk about something in the agenda because I think it'll help. You know, so I'll link a suggestion in our process to their own goals sometimes. Um, so sometimes I will just check in to see if their goals are the same or if they've grown or changed or um, you know, if we need to kind of modify the goals for the process. So often if somebody gets more like a self-understanding, they might come up with other things or like a bigger picture of what they want to work on than what they thought they did. So sometimes we'll go back and I'll tweak it. But my role is, I, I feel my role there is just to kind of raise the issue and, and remind them of the goal and let them either confirm it's still the same goal or um, kind of be reminded that that is the goal, um, or then to change it if it needs to be changed. Right, so. Right, right, right. so I have some questions about what uh, factors that might influence the the, the outcome. Okay. And one of them is expectance uh, expectations that you have and and the clients have. So 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 do you do something to to create positive expectations? Um. That is a great question. Do I do something to create positive expectations? Well, I, a lot of our clients come to the university because they've heard about our work in coaching. We've been doing this a long time. So they usually come into it with some positive hopes and expectations because they either know somebody else at their organization who's gone through it or um, maybe there's graduates of our executive MBA program, you know, that they know. Um, so there's usually some sort of kind of personal connection that somebody has to at least an awareness of the process. So they're kind of predisposed to be somewhat positive. For those who um, maybe don't know as much about what we do and just think they might want to work with a coach, whether it's somebody I meet just as an individual or kind of independent client or through the school's programs, um, I often just ask a question at the beginning about, um, have you ever worked with a coach or been through a coaching process yourself so that I can um, know that and learn about them and also understand what type of coaching that was or is, if it's current. And then I um, can explain the process that I had shared earlier, kind of the process that I follow, and we tend to do at our school quite a bit, um, and situate that, you know, a little differently, um, or in support of kind of their own experiences, help them understand the um, similarities and differences between the two. Um, and then I usually just um, just tell them that most folks really have a great experience, which is my experience. I'm being truthful. Um, they really get a lot out of it, and that would be my hope for them also. So right. I just express kind of my my own hope and also uh, my commitment to them. Yeah. You know, that I'm very committed to their development. Um, for me personally, I love executive coaching. I feel very fortunate that I've, I'm in this kind of line of work. So I, I feel it's a privilege to work with individuals on their um change, you know, whatever their desired change is, um, to kind of walk side by side with them in that journey. 
Um, so I just say that. I just let people know that's kind of who I am and, and um, how excited I am because I feel that way and, and just express it. So um, that's usually how it goes. And, and when you work with somebody, how, how do you create and maintain a good working relationship with them? Um, well, for coaching to work as a relationship, you have to establish trust early, early on. And so those first couple conversations I had shared earlier, even the very first one where I'm just getting to know them and they're getting to know me, um, I try to um, be very open. Um, I ask a lot of questions and I try to actively listen. Um, and I share with them my hopes for the process, my role, you know, all of that uh, with within intention because I want them to have information that they need to make a good decision if this is something that they want to do, if I'm the right person to work with them, um, and then also to get excited about it if, in fact, those first two conditions are met. Um, so I just try to be myself, I guess, ask questions, listen, be uh, optimistic, you know, and friendly. Early on, um, I, I always emphasize the confidentiality piece of it, even though a lot of folks pretty much assume that. They say that, oh, I just assumed it. I think you have to always state um, that this is confidential, especially in my role. I uh, wear a lot of different hats at the university and often at the client. So, um, I feel it's important for me to make sure that they know that whatever the two of us discuss stays between the two of us, doesn't get talked about with other faculty members, doesn't get talked about with their client partners or whatever, so that if they wish to share something, that's great, but then they share it. And if they want me to talk to their boss or talk to somebody else, I'm happy to do it, but they have to set that up and they, the person and I have to talk about it first. Right. So that I know what's okay to talk about and what's not. Right. So, um, so I say all of that pretty much just like I did with you. Um, throughout our engagement, I just try to stay connected with them via email. And every now and then I'll call to check in. How's it going? How's, how's it going on the assignments? Are you doing okay answering the questions? Or working on whatever it is that they're working on? Um, Sometimes I, um, I might see something online, I might see a short article, I might see something on a blog that reminds me of them, something they're interested in or something that they're working on and I'll, I'll send it over to them to say, just thinking of you, thought you might, thought you might find this interesting. So I, I send them little things like that. Um, so at the end of the coaching experience, I um, sometimes I, do silly things like I, I either send them books or plaques or I recently started making up CDs of songs <laughs> because I find that music really connects people across cultures um, and really unites us and so I just follow different kinds of genres of music and I just made a CD that kind of really is meant to capture the intentional change process. So. And some of them are songs that are um, more current and some are from like more oldies kind of thing. And um, I usually try to pick a whole bunch of different ones so I can hit something that might make them laugh or be great if they're like runners or on the treadmill or whatever they're working out. So they've got something to listen to that kind of connects them to their own change process. Yeah. So I do that sometimes. Um, so. Oh, the other thing I do intentionally that I think people have told me is very helpful is that, especially after the first the first two meetings where we're talking about the ideal and the real is I take notes and I type them up and I send back the notes. And the notes can be three, four pages sometimes. And they take a while to type. Yeah. You know, so uh, there's lots of times where I think, I don't know that this is value added, but in my heart and in my mind, I think it helps. It helps me to have a track record. Yeah. So I can go back and refresh myself on the conversation later, especially if it's like a year later with like yeah. this other woman. But they tell me they pulled out their coaching notes a lot. Oh. And 
So they'll tell me it was so great to have those notes because I know what happens. We get off the phone or we leave the meeting and they go back into like crazy reality of whatever meeting and other kind of demands and commitments they have on their time. Yeah. And that reflective space just gets cut off immediately. Yeah. Yeah. So the notes serve as kind of a way to enable them, <clears throat> excuse me, to go back yeah. and reconnect with what it was that they, they were thinking about and what we discussed. So. Right, right, right. Uh, and other ways you help them um, stay engaged in the process between the sessions? Um, well, the biggest way they stay engaged is their assignments. So the assignments not only require individual work, or not require, but include reflective work on their own, but often involve engaging with other people. So one of the assignments, for instance, is to create a personal board of directors. Yeah. That's where you identify individuals um, that um, you admire, that you either enjoy working with or would like to develop a relationship with. That, and we encourage them to think about individuals who will help them with their ideal self and the attainment of that, or whatever their learning goals and plans are. Um, that exercise actually is, I was mentioning this book, Becoming a Resident Leader is one of the exercises in this book. So I would just kind of turn to that page and walk through it. But that includes them identifying people and going to talk to those people. Right. So that's an example of an assignment that is very active, like um, socially in a sense. You know, there's a network of individuals they're seeking, connecting with, talking to, that um, is helping them, but then also helping the process stay alive. So. <laughs> And, and what do your clients tell you is most helpful to them? Um, there's a couple of things I tend to hear a lot. One is that um, it was just helpful to have time to think about the questions I asked and to talk to somebody. Um, so just the simple, um, the simple, I guess, factor of having time set aside to, for you know, another individual to think about what's important to them or to think about what they're working on and then to make some choices eventually about like what, what do I want to do or is the way I'm spending my time the best for what I'm trying to accomplish. All those things um, often get short-circuited in the scope of a busy day, a busy job, a busy life. So they appreciate having that time and they appreciate being able to talk to somebody that they feel um, is there for them, you know, so it's so always a support to them um, and that they feel kind of safe talking to. Right, right, right. So I hear that probably the most out of all. It is a really important reminder for me in this work and I do a lot of training of coaches and I, re I try to remind them as well, don't underestimate the power of holding this reflective space. So even if you ask and discuss two or three questions as opposed to 15 or 20, you know, it's not about quantity. It's about being able to have a discussion where maybe you're helping somebody think through a couple of things. But for them, it can lead to very exponential kind of phases of growth, personal growth. So. Um, so it's, it's kind of humbling to re remember that. Um, and also, when the more you learn about coaching, the more you might want to try different tools or you know interventions. And all that's great. But you just want to make sure you kind of stay very connected to the other person, because they might just want you to have a conversation with them. Right. And that might be exactly what they're going to find most meaningful. Right, right, right. And how can you tell whether or not they're progressing? Well. Um, I can tell they're progressing in a couple of ways. One is, are they doing the assignments? So are they coming back with um, some things completed, some thoughts filled out? So it's not always like completing an, an assessment, although we talked about you know how I do use those and those are helpful. But it might be um, reflecting on times when um, you get frustrated at work. We'll take that as an emotional trigger. And maybe I've assigned them journal journaling, where they need to pay attention in a day's time, moments where they felt like they were getting really kind of frustrated 
and then what happened in those moments. Yeah. And journal about it. Journal about what they did, what they said, how they felt about it. And then to do that, I often say do that for like two or three weeks. So that's an example of, you know, did they take the time to, to do that and complete that for themselves? So that's one way. Right. Another way is um, the extent to which they are holding their commitments to have the meetings. So if somebody is continuing to postpone or cancel our conversations, um, more than say three times, because life happens, you know, these are busy people, schedules get crazy, so once or twice it's really not a flag. But three, four, five times, then I think they clearly are not engaged in the process. I don't know why usually. You know, so trying to get to the bottom of why is another another kind of piece of detective work. Yeah. Um, but but that right there is an indicator that that they're not engaged. So the flip is when someone always sets the time aside, always makes the meetings. You know that this is yeah, important yeah, to them. Yeah, right. yeah. And then thirdly, of course, is how they show up in the either on the phone or in the in person. Are they excited and engaged and interested and um, are they sh are they telling me that, um, or are they kind of like, this has really been difficult, you know? Like, so what yeah, is it yeah, that yeah. they're experiencing? Right, right. And and when they progress, how, how, what do you think might be the causes? Like, what could be some of the mechanisms causing progress? Well, um, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but over and over again, we find that the work on the ideal self and the vision is powerful, and so probably the greatest amount of progress and growth, personal growth that I see, comes from that. Uh, the insights that people draw from that reflection, writing it down, thinking about it, having to articulate it back to somebody, all helps people to clarify what's important to them and commit to it. And that's intentional in, our, in my coaching process. You know, Getting them to write it down is a very intentional aspect of it because of that. So, um, so that's, that's very, very powerful. I think every step you know, along the way has its own um, benefit. You know, having people really examine their um, 360 feedback, for instance, is helpful. There's a lot of data on how helpful 360 can be. It's certainly used in a lot of you know, organizations and a lot of settings. And part of it is that it's so comprehensive that it, that's one way I think it's useful. It's also just a a way for individuals to validate, you know, here's some things I'm doing that is working, yeah. as well as here's a couple things that I need to consider changing. And it's a snapshot at, in time that we don't always get, you know, we don't always get that kind of comprehensive feedback from that's useful from mm -hmm. so many different people. So, um, so that often creates a lot of progress right there um, for individuals. So. Um, I think overall, though, this I find this to be a very iterative process, meaning that it's best when you have several meetings with somebody over at least several months, because you want to be able to have them think about it, go away to themselves, work on it, kind of, you know, just sit with it, work on the assignments, come back, talk about it, do it again. So it's like, that's what I mean by the iterations of the process, because that's where then I see movement, right, right, right. as opposed to maybe just one meeting that's longer, two yeah. meetings that are longer. You just, you just not able to get as far as you can right, right, right. in the process. And, and how do you develop uh, as a professional? Um, so I, I try to develop or, or continue to develop in a number of ways. Um, working at a university is a real blessing because we have tons of courses in our executive education division and um, so I'm able to attend a lot of those, some are one and two day courses. I also um, have started to teach coaching, um, we have certifications and coaching training and I find I develop um, a lot when I have to teach it because then I really understand the, the subject matter, that philosophy, the approach, maybe sometimes the approach I've been using a long time, but now I have to teach it, so it deepens my own understanding of why it's been working for me or what it is that, that does work about it. So, um, so that's another way of kind of seeking out um, teaching experiences. I learn a ton from my clients, actually, so staying active in my coaching practice helps me to continue to develop. 
Um, I also am a member of the Academy of Management, you know, um, as a PhD student and at the university. That's um, a group of like 15,000 academics we meet annually, and there's divisions that focus more on management, um, education and development, or change, and so I belong to those divisions, and coaching is a, one of the um, topics that's talked about from a research perspective as well as a practice. So I get a lot of kind of support from that. Um, and other professional kind of connections. You know, I had the chance to present at the um, Harvard Coaching Conference this year, and so that's where we had met. And you know, so that you meet a lot of people who are involved in the field and doing really innovative work, research as well as practice. Um, also, the Consortium for Research on Emotional Intelligence, even though it's largely about EI, as the name suggests, there's there's a very close connection to coaching there. And a lot of the um, individuals that, that I might meet there are interested and or already involved in this kind of work. And probably the, the biggest area for me right now is that I am, um, as I had mentioned, a PhD student. And my uh, focus of my research is executive coaching. So that kind of by default keeps you really up to speed on the latest research, the latest you know, articles and books. And, um, and my um, research study that I'm about to embark on for my dissertation is focusing on the impact of emotional intelligence and executive coaching on leader effectiveness. So, um, so in the future, I hope, hope to have some more to share on that. I'm just getting ready to collect the data at this point, but, but essentially it'll be um, a study where I'm um, surveying the top 300 leaders in a bank in the Midwest, um, where they, those leaders have um, already completed emotional intelligence training, received 360-degree feedback, and worked with an executive coach uh, following the process of intentional change theory. So I'm hoping to then collect um, some data from them about their um, the coaching relationships they've had um, and how coaching as well as emotional intelligence helps them with certain outcomes like job performance, um, articulating their personal vision, their career satisfaction, and the like. So. Mm -hmm. and what would you say is um, special about positive psychology and coaching? If, if, like, some people don't necessarily use positive psychology when they when they coach. So let me just share this quote. Um, you had sent me a link with some other some other folks who have done speeches or uh, maybe been teaching about positive psychology, and I happened to um, just listen to a couple of those and. And this description really um, stayed with me. This is um, from Carol Kaufman's, one of her presentations. And, it, and she described positive psychology as the study of what makes life worth living. And went on to quote Jonathan, I think it was Jonathan Haidt, if I had that right, and that positive psychology is the study of the conditions and processes that lead to optimal functioning. And so when I apply that to coaching, um, I think what really makes it special is that um, we have the opportunity as coaches to help individuals um, tap into the best of who they are and the best of who they can be. Um, and that's really, I think, a place of honor and privilege to do that kind of work and it is very meaningful work for them and also for us to be on the receiving end of it. Um, so being able to see kind of the aha moments that come from that, the transformation at the personal level that then kind of impacts so many people in their, each person's network is really phenomenal and rewarding. So I find that compared to like earlier ways that I was coaching where it was more dominated on kind of the um, weaknesses and shoring up weaknesses, which is still a piece of what I do, but now is kind of um, balanced with an emphasis on you know more kind of positive psychology and just helping them understand um, the best of who they are. 
what happens is a greater level and possibility of transformation, positive transformation, and that that is sustainable, yeah. and more sustainable for individuals. So all the way around, I think it's just, um, it's, it's just opens up so many possibilities for really wonderful change. Right, right, right. And what advice would you give to others if they were to start moving into this field, applying some research from positive psychology and coaching? Mm -hmm. um, right now the field has been, I think, exploding. It, for the past several years it certainly has, so it's not happening you know, now. I want to give credit to like, a lot of the, the founders, certainly you know, Marty Seligman, a lot of the folks at the University of Michigan, um, and it was Marty Seligman there at Penn State, David Cooperider, and Prisha Minquiry, um, and it was more recently Barbara Fredrickson and all of her work, and, and so many others that I don't mean to intentionally be leaving out, but they, those individuals certainly kind of got us um, started down a really phenomenal path, and unbelievable developments, I think, are happening. Um, so one piece of advice would be to just kind of stay up to speed as much as you can on the latest research and um, training and just programs on, on positive psychology in general and then coaching. Because coaching in and of itself is a field that's really emerging. We're learning a lot about it. Um, but the research is still trying to catch up to the practice. And so um, keeping an open mind and being willing to, to learn and then also to contribute back through dialogue, through blogs, through your own research if you're a researcher. Um, also would be a piece of advice so that together we can share what we're learning about what works and then kind of be support to each other. Mm -hmm.